excellent, excellent beauty. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for being you to us, our everlasting Father, our salvation, our light, our hope. You are everything we couldn't bear to dream. We praise you. We honor you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Our time together this morning, we desire to hear your heart and to be transformed by your word. We praise you. We need new identities. And we look up to you for a change this morning in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. I thank you for the expectations of, our, of each one's heart that you are willing to meet. And I thank you because there are no hindrances to receiving from you this morning. I thank you for the miracles. I thank you for the touch. I thank you for what, for doing all that only you can do. And I thank you for the joy that overflows. I thank you for whatever you do is perfect. Nothing can, uh, uh, nothing can, no, nothing can obstruct what you do. But I thank you for the restoration. I thank you for salvation. I thank you for the comfort. I thank you for edification. I thank you, Lord, for everything that you are doing for us. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want to uh, continue on the series that we have been on here, uh, seeing ourselves the way God sees us, seeing ourselves the way God sees us. And I want to uh, encourage uh, everyone watching on Zoom or Facebook or whatever medium you use. Uh, this is the third part of the series we have been on for the past two weeks. We say that God gave us eyes, but we have to do the seeing. God gave us the mind, but we have to do the thinking. God gave us the will, but we have to exercise it. We live in a culture where we blame everything either on the Lord or on the devil. But like we have seen in scriptures that the, the devil doesn't force us to do anything. He entices us. He leads our lives by his influence. Is the same way God does. Amen. We are independent entities and our decisions are, are, will end up bringing us the results that we, I'm hearing something from God. He's saying for me to say to us that in my word, I said that only at the witness of two shall anything be confirmed to be legitimate or to be, you know, confirmed. In other words, God has an opinion of you. He has made a statement concerning you and Satan has an opinion of you. He made a statement concerning you, but none of this will come to pass in your life unless you add your own opinion. And how do you add your own opinion? You add your own opinion by what you believe and what you say with your mouth. For I think the Holy Spirit is taking me in a different angle, but I'm just going to roll along, okay? I say, for with the heart, man believes unto righteousness. Let me reverse that. For with the heart, man disbelieves unto condemnation. All right? If the heart can believe unto righteousness, the heart can also disbelieve God unto condemnation. And now he says, and with the confession of the, of the mouth, salvation is, re, is received. And I can also reverse that to say, with the refusal to confess, salvation is denied, or with the choice to confess, not according to the will of God, but according to the will of the devil, damnation comes, what we call damnation. All right? comes so i didn't think of that the spirit of god just gave it to me right now so now 
we are going to continue in the, and today I like to invite us to let the scriptures speak to us, okay? We are going to read, this is going to be the longest reading I have ever done. We are going to read two whole chapters of the Bible. Is that okay? All right. What, I'm, what I have, what I can say is not important. Let the scripture speak to us. Numbers chapter 13. Numbers chapter 13, if you are there. We are going to sum something up, some things up, but we are going to also trust the Lord to, uh, to speak to us through his word. God's word, when you engage God's word for yourself, what you discover from it is way beyond what any human being can ever say to you. Amen? So we see here in Numbers chapter 13, God was taking the children of Israel somewhere. And maybe because of time, I just sum it up. So it's not, I just summarize a, a section of chapter, four, uh, chapter 13. And then we can take chapter 14. Is that all right? Can we do that? Okay, good. We sum it up because it's a long read. But when you go, we're after church, I want to encourage you to please read chapter 13 yourself and chapter 14, read it fully. Chapter 13 talks about God taking the, it's a process. He was taking the children of Israel from Egypt to the promised land. And the Bible says that they got to a certain point where Moses, uh, God said to Moses, from, that is from verse 1 to 29, God said to Moses, choose leaders from each of the tribe, one leader from each tribe, and let them go out to spy out the land. To spy out means to go and see and bring news, okay? And from the 12 tribes of Israel, each person, each leader of the tribe was selected. And they came to Moses and Moses told them, go to the land of Canaan, where the Jebusites, the, the Hivites and whatever, all the ites that were occupied there, that they were occupying. He said, check out the land for us. Tell us the kind of soil they have. Tell us about their security system. Tell us about their economy. Look at the whole system. What are their social, well, social services like? What are the potentials they have there? How strong is their military? You know, check the land thoroughly for us and bring us news. And as I was looking at these, the Spirit of God said to me that the reason why God selected the leaders was because he wanted the leaders to bring a positive influence to the people. This is very contrary to what our leaders are doing today. Our leaders are bringing negative influences to us. They tell us things that scare us. They actually want to destroy us because of the mandates they put in place to make sure that life is not lived maximally and enjoyed. So when these people went there, they checked out the land, these 12 guys, they went over to the land of Canaan, they checked out the land, and then they returned. They returned, 12 of them, I don't know how they did it, but I'm sure that maybe each one or a pair, each one is commissioned to focus on a particular thing. Maybe that's how they strategize because if there were all 12 people if all 12 people were going to be going to investigate the economy, investigate the military, I think these are strategies, right? So we know how that works. If we're 12, we can say, okay, you are good at this, so you go here. You are better at that, so you go there. You focus on this. I, I think they divided themselves. Well, the scriptures didn't say so, so I'm just implying through my thinking now. But when they came back, when they came back, they came back and they say, yes, the land that God is sending us to is actually an excellent land. It flows with milk and honey. But look at it here. Some, sometimes God takes us today into the future that he has planned for us. The book of Jeremiah chapter 11, chapter 29, verse 11. He says, I know the plans that I have for you. If I'm too fast, please write down scriptures so you can help me 
if I straighten me up, if I if I misquote one scripture, write it down so you can straighten me up, okay? All right, Jeremiah 29, verse 11. He said, God said, for I know the plans that I have for you. I have good plans, not evil. I want to give you a future and hope. And now verse uh, 12 says, and you shall go and pray to me and I will answer you. And you will find me when you seek me with all your heart. What God is saying is, when I show you what, where I'm taking you, don't start running. Come back to me. Sit down. Let me give you the information on how to get there. It's exactly the same strategy that he used here. He told the children of Israel, I'm taking you to a land that flows with milk and honey, but I'm going to give you a strategy on how to get there. So he said, send spies first. And how does God send spies for us today? How does he send spies today? Sometimes he takes our spirits and he reveals things to us through visions and dreams. Sometimes he causes, he causes people to, from, to come. He, he puts people in our lives that have the right information that we are looking for. Sometimes he puts people in our lives to encourage. Sometimes he gives us jobs. Hey, oh, come on. He gives us jobs in places where he's taking us to become lords. He's taking us to occupy. Amen. I was looking just this week. I was thinking about my upbringing, the culture, the people in my life when I was a kid from a, a nursery school. By the way, I was the tallest in nursery school. My, I, I didn't quite fit in the chair. I remember very well that they had to keep me in front because my legs were too long and they, would, they were touching the back seat of other people. So I had to, I was forced to sit in front. So I remember my nursery school very well. I was very tall at the time, you know, but I was just imagining how did God arrange it so beautifully, the culture, the lifestyle, the, the people that he put in my life at that time and looking back, looking forward to where I am today is very similar. So I say to myself, was God sharpening the pencil for the writing of today? And God can do that. God can do that. And he does that. Remember Joseph, he was taking Joseph to become to, to the place of, of leadership in Egypt as the next to the king, Pharaoh. That is the highest position. Pharaoh occupied the highest position of the developed world at the time. I hope you know. Pharaoh was, in fact, superior to the, in, in class to any president, including the United States today. There were kings, not politicians. Amen. And pharaohs were seen as gods. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, at your word shall anything happen. If, it, if there's going to be any change, any progress, anything in the nation, it is going to come by your instruction. So the only place I'm higher than you is the place of my throne, kingship. Now, but how did, where, before God put Pharaoh there, uh, put Joseph there, God sharpened the skills and trained Joseph in the house of Potiphar first. Though as a slave, he was, he was taught to clean cars. He was taught to take care of the garden. He was taught to, those days they don't have cars, okay? They have chariots, but I'm using today's language now. He was taught to manage, to, to look into the finances. He was taught how, taught how to pay staff salaries. He was taught how to buy and sell and manage businesses as a slave. In fact, the Bible says that there was nothing. The only thing that was kept away from Joseph was Potiphar's own wife. Potif Potiphar was not in charge of any other thing. Potiphar would just say, how much do we have, Joseph? And we say, well, uh, in this, uh, this business, we just made some profit, $28 million, you know, and the other business, 
yes, we run into a little loss here, but we are going to balance up because also. So everything, Joseph was in charge. Joseph said, we just ordered two buses for the workers. He said, oh, uh, by the way, we are ordering you a new jet. Your old jet is, is going to be being sold. It's too old for you now. So he was, I'm using the language of today. He was totally in charge. He was totally in charge. Now, if you look at your life and you see where God is taking you to, for those of us who are willing to follow God, because sometimes we see where God is taking us to, but we are hesitant or we are not cooperating with God. Now, God wants us to cooperate with him. When these people came back, verse 30, verse 30 of chapter 13, they came back and from verse 30, look at verse 32. The yes attitude that God was expecting was not what they got, what he got. He sent sometimes God will put somebody in your life and say, hey, this is what God wants you to do. And you say yes, and you go and make it a decision of something else. You decide on something else on your own. And we're looking at, we're looking at, uh, Numbers chapter 13, look at verse 32. The land is bad, it destroys its own people. And many of us say, well, how can I have a job in that company? That company is awful. This is, uh, uh, but this is a company, you ask the Lord, Lord, please send me to where you want me to be. Have you ever heard Christians say, uh, I don't like that place because I happen to be the only Christian there? You've heard people say things like that. I don't really like that company. I don't have any. I'm the only Christian that they, they, they do this, they, they do that. People swear, people do that. People swear, I'm the only Christian there, so I don't like that. I want to find another job. Oh, God is saying, well, I thought you said I should lead you to where I want you to be. And you represent me. You are my light to shine there. That's why I put you there. Other people will say, well, they have a lot of uh, Spanish people in this place. We don't want to live there. They have a lot of immigrants in the other place. They don't want to live there. Oh, this other is full of black people here. We don't want to live there. Oh, this people is full of low income here. We don't want to live there. Oh, these other people are all white people here. We don't want to live there. Why? We use our own human thinking to walk ourselves out of the will of God. God sees you as human. He sees you as his representative. He sees you as his light when he positions you or where he takes you, wherever he takes you, please be faithful. He says here, verse 32 says, the people complain. He said that this land destroys his people, but this is the land God chose for you. So what you are saying is you are accusing God of being irresponsible. God hates me. He's putting me to walk in a bad place where my faith will be destroyed. Or where my, because we sometimes we become too religious that we think we are we are we sanctimonious, you know, where we say that oh, if if God, I don't want to walk there, I don't want to lose my salvation, I don't want to lose my faith. What kind of salt are you? What kind of salt are you? Every good salt that I know changes the environment it is put into. If your kind of salt is so dull that the environment will change you, then you are not God's kind of salt. Amen? He said that the people complain. He said the land destroys their own people. Verse 32, right? So what God has given is terrible. God has taken us to an awful place. I asked God for a husband. He gave me... I asked God for a wife. He gave me... I asked God for children, for children, and he gave, look at what he gave me. I asked God for good neighbors, look at what he gave me. I feel like punching somebody who thinks like that. Please don't think like that. <laughs> Stop, quit, quit thinking like that. Quit thinking that way. If you sincerely ask the Lord, remember, gold doesn't come shining from the ground. Amen. Diamond doesn't come with all the dazzles, the, 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 the brilliance. It has to go through a process. Amen. God knew that there were giants in that land. 
God knew that the, the land also flowed with milk and honey. God knew that the military might of that land is stronger than and much more than the experience of these ex-slaves. Remember the children of Israel were ex-slaves? They had no training. They had no understanding on how to manage economy. They had nothing. That is why God gave them the kind of laws that he gave them. Even the law, including how to clean up the environment. God had to break it down. When you go to the washroom, please dig because they didn't have the kind of washrooms we have today. They go to the bush for washroom. So God said, before you go to dump, dig the ground, bury the whatever you put there and close it up. He said that. He gave them details on how, what to eat, what not to eat because God understood that they were slaves. They had no good mentoring. So God kept them in the wilderness to mentor them, to change the picture of the, that they had of themselves in over 400 years. Oh, come on. So that they can start to see themselves the way God sees them. Can I tell you something? What you consider to be your weakness or weaknesses is not strange to God. Stop advising him on how you want him to do, on what you want him to do. God doesn't need your suggestion. God picked Moses, who was a stammerer. Moses updated God, oh Lord, sir, you, I think you're forgetting something. Remember, do you know that I don't speak well? Do you know I don't walk well? Do you know I don't read well? Do you know I don't, I don't understand grammar? Do you know I don't know mathematics? Do you know I don't know physics? Do you know I can't cook well? As if God needs you to update him. Remember, anything that God is taking you to, he already has the resources to equip you to own it. God will not give you something. Hey, he said in the book of uh, Luke, he said, if you fathers that are evil-hearted know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more would your heavenly father give the good gifts to his children? I want to speak to somebody who has hope, who has a desire for a brilliant future. I want you to know that God is not looking at where you are, what you know, what you have. He's not looking at what you can or cannot do. All he wants you to do is to believe that if you are taking me there, then you're going to help me get there. If you are giving me this, you're going to help me to maintain it, to sustain it. If you're going to do, hey, how many of us know that Donald Trump was not cut out to be a politician? Okay, I'm not talking about politics today. All right. But he doesn't have the nice language of a leader of a free world. It's not a good talker. But God put him there. What are you going to do about it? Well, I, uh, this is what I believe. I don't want you to believe that. But I'm just using somebody that most people know as somebody who may be unfit. Because he would speak first and then think about it later. And some of us are there. Peter was there too. All right. Peter was like that. Peter will speak first and say, oh, what did I just say? And sometimes I do the same thing myself. Oh, I shouldn't have said that, you know. God does not choose you because you qualify. He chooses you, then he qualifies you. Amen. So these people brought evil report. Look at verse, verse, 30, verse 33. What happened here? Bible says, they saw the place. They said, we, the land is good, but we saw the sons of Anak there and the Nephilims there. And we are like grasshoppers in our eyes compared to them. We are like grasshoppers in our eyes compared to these people. He said, we are like grasshoppers. Can someone read it for me, verse 33? Anybody? Yes, please. And there we saw the giants. And there we saw the giants. The sons of Anak. Uh -huh. Which come the giants. Do the descendants of Anak, yeah? Hallelujah. And so we were it, it wasn't the sons of Anak or the giants that called them grasshoppers. It wasn't God that called them grasshoppers. It, they called themselves grasshoppers. Can you see how we disqualify ourselves? And we say, hey, uh, what is that term? They, I heard somebody use 
a certain term? Dumb, dumb. You heard the word dumb before? Okay. Uh, you heard the, the de deadbeat? You heard, you heard that kind of term before? A failure? You heard that kind of term before? Irresponsible? You heard that kind of term before? Those terms, you will never hear God call you by those names. No, no. God will never, no matter what you have done, God will never call you a bad name. So stop calling yourself a bad name. Amen? Stop, stop, actually, stop thinking negatively about yourself. He said, we saw the sons of, so God did not, remember God didn't send them to say, go check. If you compare yourself with them and see where you stand, that's not what he sent them to do. He said, go check out the land and bring report. Let's see what they got. He didn't say, go compare yourself with them. Now, but look at it this way. How old are you now? Look at yourself and say, how old are you now? State your age from the time you were one week old till today. Who has been taking care of you? God. So now God says, I'm going to take you to 100 years old. And you are saying, oh, I don't believe that will happen. Because in my family, this doesn't happen. People, most of our family members die at whatever age you want to come. Or most family members of ours, they don't rise beyond a certain level. They just go to college and that is it. So if I'm going for PhD and I'm going for this and that, no, that, that is not in our family. In our family, we are not professionals like that. We are all farmers. Or in my family, we are not that. We are only this. You are comparing yourself with the things you see and the people you know. So what do you do? You, you cut yourself short. Amen. Come on, amen. Come on, amen. God wants you to quit comparing yourself with somebody else. He understands how slim you are, how tall you are, how short you are, how, can I use a, a politically incorrect language, fat you are. He knows your weight, he knows your height, he knows your size. He knows the amount of fuel that he has deposited in your spirit. He knows there's nothing that you can do to change it. In fact, he said by worrying about what you have and what you don't have does not change your hair gray or black, bad to, to black. Worry. Actually, worry. Worry eats you out from the inside. It destroys you from within. He said, we compared ourselves with them. And this is how we see ourselves. Can you see? Instead of seeing themselves the way God sees them. Oh, this, this new job that God has given me. I don't know whether I'm qualified for it. I don't have the skill for it. Really? Oh. This is why I said last week that I tried to cut off from my life people that are negative. Because it can rub off on you. I'm not looking for perfect people. I'm looking for people who can see themselves differently so they can inspire me to see myself differently too. The people you hang around with will determine how, how far you go. Amen. Amen. See somebody whose brain is working. Hey, you are going to be my friend, whether you like it or not. Uh, you must be my friend. If your brain is not working, sorry. I'll wait till later on. Somebody who is passionate about something, you're going to be my friend. Somebody who has a vision, you got to be my friend. I don't spell my name right. It doesn't matter. I'm still going somewhere. I don't know how to count my fingers on one hand properly, but it doesn't matter. It's not about being smart. Can I tell us something? There's a difference between being smart and being wise. If you have to pick one, pick wisdom. Because a wise person will lead the smart person. Some of us say, well, I don't know the answer. If they ask me questions, my answers don't flow so smoothly and brilliantly. Who told you that that is what makes a leader? Leaders are made, people of the heart, people who can see far, people who believe that I can, the yes, I can, the yes, I will attitude are the ones that God enjoys working with. 
because they choose to believe God in spite of their circumstances. And I want to say to you today, change your picture. Let God give God something to walk with. Change the picture that God, that the picture of yourself, you have. Allow God something. God took the, the, the what's his name? His friend, Abraham. One, one night, he said to Abraham, come on, get up. See the stars? I'm using this as a count, start counting. And Abraham started to count. And Abraham count. How many of you have start, tried to count stars from your compound? How far did you go? How far did you go to count stars? <laughs> you will count one like seven times and, you know, just go there one, two, three, four. Did I count that? Okay, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, just give up. He just give up. Then God said to him, as many as they are, so shall your children be. Can I tell you something? When God made that statement to Abraham, Abraham was still barren. They didn't have a child. And they were advanced in age. So God must be speaking to the wrong person. Sometimes God says to you, he gives you a dream. You have a desire. I'm going to be a professional here. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. I'm... When I got called to ministry, I was extremely shy that at Bible studies, when I raised my hand to ask a question, immediately when they say you, Brother Jerry, as soon as they say so, every, I just go blank. And I start to sweat. I was so shy. I know you guys won't believe that now. But this, this is a credit to the transforming power of God. Today, there is no human being with a head that I can't talk with comfortably. I may not be an expert in the subject that is raised, <laughs> but I'm going to have something to say. Amen. Even if it's just to say, yes, I agree with you. That is something. Amen. Hallelujah. Even if I don't say much, like I, my Spanish, I say, see, I nod my head. I'm saying something. Because God removed the hindrance from me. The hindrance was timidity. I was shy, very shy. God took it away. God knows what doesn't fit in the place, fit in you for the place that is taking you. And it's going to help you. But let me say something. Some of us, God comes to remove what doesn't fit and we don't let him do it. Mm. Have you ever heard people say, well, uh, it's hard for a, a, an old dog to learn new tricks? You call yourself an old dog. <laughs> you will remain at the back of the house. Or where do they keep dogs? At the pen. <laughs> When you believe that you cannot learn new tricks, mm -hmm. what you have done is you've shut down the faculties that are supposed to open up to start secreting the ability to learn things. Wow. As a man thinks in his heart, so he is. Mm -hmm. Amen. Some of us say, well, I have failed so many times in one area or the other that I don't think I fit anymore. Well, I have not seen one person in the Bible that has not failed. If you consider it failure, God will accept it. But if you consider it as a learning curve, God will see it that way. The choice is yours. Now let's come over to chapter 15, chapter 14 now. Chapter 14, I'm just going to cut to the chase a little bit, but please try to read it. And then I'm going to ask somebody to pick up from verse 13 for me. Okay, from verse one to five, be careful what you hear and what you believe. Because when those people came with those negative news that the land devours his inhabitants and the sons of Anax and the giants were there, in other words, they said, we can't do it. I can't, Henry Ford said, if you think you can't, you are right. The I can't attitude is a self-defeating attitude it's a, it's, a, it's a progress blocker. I can't. I can't. Who told you you can't? God never called somebody to say, can you do this for me? He never said so. He would say, come, you are going to do this. 
because it is not dependent on whether you can or can't. God knows that within yourself you can, but with Him you can. Bible says, for we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. So verse, verse, if you come with me to verse six to nine, verse six to nine, Joshua had a yes, I can mindset. Caleb was the only person, Caleb and Joshua were the only people from all the 12 who came with a positive result. They say no. We see that the Anaks are there, the giants are there. Yes, we acknowledge that because faith does not deny reality, but faith chooses not to hinge or settle with reality. It chooses to sit and hinge itself on the ability of God. Oh, come on now. Am I speaking to somebody? To say my finances is not good, it's not healthy, it's not lack of faith. You are admitting the fact but fact and truth are different. When you say my, fi I'm just using finances as an example. My finances, or maybe you say my health is not at its best or my this or that is not at its best right now. You are accepting the facts, but remember facts can change. You are acknowledging the circumstances. Circumstances are transient. They can change. Be careful what you hear, be careful. Who speaks to you? Be careful who speaks. Choose who speaks into your life. Choose somebody who is going to say to you, yes, here I see, I acknowledge that you, yes, here you need help. Here I need help. Over there you need some strengthening. But remember, we are going to make it. We will make it. We are going to recover. We are getting there. We will arrive. We will do this. We will do that. Don't fall for the people who take faith confession out of context to say something is wrong. And then they say, oh, I, in the name of Jesus, I know it's perfect. No, no, no. If you deceive yourself, you cannot make a change. Don't deceive yourself. Understand what the facts are. Go back to God and say, remember he said in verse 20, verse 12 of Jeremiah 29, verse 12. He says, and you shall come and pray, come and discuss with me, and I will respond to you. I know where I'm taking you. I know where I'm taking you. I'm taking you to a beautiful place. But before you head out there, in case you look and you say, hey, my, my, I don't have what it takes to get there. Come talk with me first. I'll give you the strategy. Hallelujah. Come on, hallelujah. I'm excited. I'm really excited. Acknowledge the fact. Don't make excuses. Don't anything you make excuses for, you don't change in that area. You know that? You know that? You know anything you make excuses for, you don't change? Yes, I'm wrong here. Yes, I failed here. I may fail, but I'm not a failure. Amen? And if anybody here, under the sound of my voice, if you know you've never failed, let me know. Then I see somebody who has never attempted a thing. Amen. Failure is the moment you refuse to try again. You fail the moment you say, I quit. As soon as you say to yourself, I quit in your heart, you have failed. Because God cannot walk with you anymore. You have to have the hope. Do you know something? Even if I'm to stop here, I'll be fine. But do you know that for you to get, for God to help you, you have to give him something to work with? Give God something, give him the material to build you with. Let that material be your faith and your willingness. Ooh. Hallelujah. Give God something to work with. Bible says, as far as the earth remains, Genesis, right? 822. Am I correct? Is it 822? Help me out. As far as the, 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 the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall not cease. Confirm it for me, please. Anybody? Genesis 8.22. As far as the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall not cease. He said cold and winter, 
No, we, we don't we don't read like that in Africa and in India where we don't have and in other countries where we don't have snow. We don't have winter. All right. He said, but as far as the earth remains, seed time and harvest shall not cease. In other words, as long as the laws of nature last, you have to sow in order to reap. That's what he's saying. If you don't give, you cannot receive. That's what he's saying. Amen. Come on, amen. If you don't give, if you do not give of your time, if you do not give of your effort, if you do not give, I'm not talking about giving of money in church. That is also important, but that's not what we're talking about. You got to sow. You got to invest something to get something. Thank you. Genesis 8, 22. I got it right. Somebody just confirmed. Thank you so much. Okay. So now, verse 1 to 5 of chapter 14, be careful who speaks into your life. Be careful who you hang out with. There are some people that are just interested in pulling you down because they are jealous of what you carry. Remember the reason why Joseph was sold was because Joseph was a dreamer? That's the reason. Remember what the Bible says? The Bible says his brother said to him, come, let us kill him and let's see what becomes of his dreams. So it is not you that is the threat. It is what you carry that is the threat. And that is why Satan will bring people to tear you down, to, to demoralize you, to discourage you, to, to break you down, to lie against you, to stifle your progress. So you got to be careful what you choose, who you choose to hang around you. Choose who, you, hey, come on, don't look for a perfect person. You are not going to find, look for somebody who has fallen many times, but he got up and he, he kept going. That is the person I want around me. Amen. Not a perfect person. Somebody who will say, I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to quit. You failed, they knock you out a hundred times. You got up one more time. I'm going to try 101. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Look at verse chapter 14. Come with me now. Come with me now. Chapter 14. Numbers chapter 14. Are you there? I'm going to round up now but I'm going to have somebody pick it up from verse 13. Before you pick it up from verse 13, can you look at it? All right. The entire community picked up and wanted to stone Moses. Right? This is, this is their response. Look at, look at something here that I want to point this out before we move on to that. Gotta, we got to move on to that. Hallelujah. God was saying, he said, how long shall these people, uh, do they want to continue to, to disbelieve me? All right. How long will they continue to disbelieve me? How long will they despise me? Look at it here from verse 10. All right. From verse 10. Okay. Then the Lord's glory appeared in the meeting tent to all Israelites, the Lord said to Moses, how long will these people disrespect me? So your unbelief, every time God says, I want to do something. Sometimes somebody say, well, God has never told me that he's going to do this or do that with me. But have you read it in the word and you know that God has a plan for your life? That is God telling you what he wants to do with your life. Amen. Sometimes you stay on your own and you are able to, your mind, your heart takes you into the future. And he sees, you can see yourself as a manager, as a business owner. You can, you can see yourself as a, a real estate mogul. You know, it can, you see yourself in a place that you think you don't have the resources to, but you are dreaming anyway. Can I tell you something? Every dream of your heart can come to pass. Disbelieving God is disrespecting God. How long will they doubt me after all the signs that I performed among them? Now look at their action, the reaction of God to their unbelief. He says, I will strike them down with the plague and I will disown them. That was when God got upset. After all I did for you, when you were born, I was there. I watched you. I helped you. I groomed you. I brought you to where you are. 
I healed you before. I can do it again. I fed you before. I can feed you again. I gave you a job before. I can restore that job. I gave you a house before. I can give it again. I blessed you with a car before. I can do it again. I have cared for you. I have shown you over and over that I am interested in you and I care about you and you keep disbelieving me and you do not want to walk with me and, I'm, and I want to still take you. The journey is not over yet. Don't quit. And you say, no, I'm done. I'm, I'm quitting because of this experience, because of that experience, because I'm not tall enough, because I'm not fat enough, because I'm not strong enough, because I don't have it. As long as you feed yourself with what you don't have, God has no room to put into your spirit what he has planned for you. God said, I can't walk with this kind of people. Mm. Amen. Hallelujah. May that never be your situation. Amen. Amen. Let someone help me pick it up from verse 14, please. And they will They're tell me. The yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Mora, please. And they will tell it to the inhabitants of this land, for they mm -hmm. have heard that thou, Lord, art among this people, that thou, Lord, art seen face to face, and that thy cloud stands over them, and that thou goest before them by daytime in a pillar of a cloud and in a pillar of fire by night. Now, if thou shalt kill all this people as one man, then the nations which have heard the fame of thee will speak, saying, because the Lord was not able to bring this people into the land which he sware unto them. Therefore, he has slain them in the wilderness. And now I... Hallelujah. Oh. Hallelujah. Hang on. Hang on, Myra. You're going to finish it up for me. I can't let that pass. Do you know that sometimes we know that God is upset with us? You do something and you know he's upset with you. Right? Right? Now, can I tell you something? Just like you will go to your father and say, Daddy, I'm sorry. I'm not going to do it again. That is what he wants you to do. Mm -hmm. And another thing I want you to see is the fact that the fact that you have a platform to sit and discuss any issue with God. You have a platform as a son and a daughter. If you see something happen wrong somewhere, you have a platform to say, when you go to God as a son and a daughter and say, Daddy, I saw so-and-so, so-and-so thing happen over here, but Lord, that is not consistent with your character. You can stand to plead the case of somebody else. Woo. Oh, come on now. I'm excited. Because you matter to God. He said, come, let us discuss. Let us discuss. Let us discuss. Moses, God decided that because these people disbelieve me, so I'm going to disown them. Moses stood up and said, Daddy, you can't do that. Lord, you can't do that. Because if you do that, this is what people are going to think. It doesn't mean that God was not aware. But God was creating an opportunity for someone, a human being from the world, from this earth, to stand up and turn the tide of his anger. Hey, maybe God is waiting for you to be the one to change the course that the family, your bloodline is, has been running. Maybe God is waiting for you to turn the, recreate the history and retell the story. But you have to sit with God and say, Lord, I want this thing to change. You can't do that. Who was it that said to God, oh Lord, will you kill the righteous with the unrighteous? Remember Abraham interceded? Now Moses is interceding. To intercede means to plead the case of another. Was he called Pastor Moses? No. Was he called Reverend Moses? No, Moses was a servant of God, just like you and I are servants of God. Title doesn't matter to God. Anybody who knows God can stand up and plead the case. In families where they say, this disease runs in the family. This situation runs in the other family. This goes in this family. You can be the one to change 
oh, 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 change it. Change it. You can change it. Amen? We can change it. We can change it. This is an example that when you go to God with faith, and you go to God based on your understanding of the character of God, you have a platform. So he told them, this is what people are going to think of you. Because what they are going to think of you is contrary to what your character is. Therefore, Lord, you are going to show mercy and you are going to forgive them. You are going to forgive them. Praise the Lord. Yes, please. So they, there are these 12 leaders. Yes. And of them, only two, Caleb and Joshua, come back with a positive, a positive result. result. So the other 10 come back with a negative report. Right. And God knew of all of the things that they were going to find because he made the land. Right. So he expected them to all come back with a positive report, regardless of what they saw? No, he expected them to come to tell the truth, but to make a choice to place their faith in the God who says, I'm giving it to you. He didn't expect them to come and lie to the people. He expected them to come and accept the facts, tell the people, yes, the people are strong, but because we trust in the Lord, we can win through God. So when they came with the nephew and they saw the giant, yes. they were to tell them what exactly? They were to tell them exactly what they saw, but still encourage the people that because our case is different because we have God on our side. So acknowledgement of facts is not wrong, but choosing to allow the facts to determine the outcome instead of God determining the outcome. We couldn't do, we couldn't do. That. It was wrong because God didn't call them grasshoppers. They belittled themselves and they belittled God who said, I'm taking you there. If you say to me, come to my house, if you say to me, come to my house, thank you, that's a very nice question. If you say to me, come to my house for dinner, all right, and I went to McDonald's and I loaded my car with stuff in case you don't have enough food for me, that means I don't have the faith that you're going to actually give me dinner. What, do, what does that show you about my thoughts of you? That makes you think, you see what I mean? That means I don't believe that you're going to really give me food. And if you're going to give me food, you might not give me the right food or enough food. So God, faith is not the denial of facts. Faith is a choice to not place your trust on the facts, but on the living God. Amen. Amen. Let me, let me suggest another verse there. Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 4, verse 17, if you read it down, you can write it if you, if you don't mind. Romans chapter 4, verse 17. Bible says, Abraham, though he was old, he did not consider his own body that was already dead, nor the deadness of Sarah's womb, but he chose to believe in God. Amen? He chose to believe in God. He chose to believe in God. Walking by faith means walking in absolute or living in absolute confidence in the veracity of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can you see that? Yeah, Romans 4 verse 16. 16 says that he, he, did, he chose not to, uh, to con he did not consider, he acknowledged that his body was old, but he did not place his faith now in his own body he placed his faith in the word of God. He believed that the person who said you will be, he will make it work out. Amen. And can I say something? There are giants in some, some of us have giants in our lives. When you have, when you have a, a fear of, certain, of anything in your family, when you maybe face a disease or face whatever it is, those can be your giants today. And you are looking at them and you are saying, because of these, I don't think I can. Because of the other one, I don't think I can. Today, people are cutting their dreams short because of COVID, right? Remember we touched that last week? People are saying, oh, because of COVID, I cannot do this anymore. These COVID people, this, uh, the absolute confidence in the veracity of God. 
that if he said it, he will bring it to pass. That is the thing that set me free for life. It sets me, it has set me free for life. God, you, if you know me well, you know that I, I shouldn't have another option other than God's word. If you know me well, you know that to, for me to lean on somebody else or lean on anything else, it doesn't, it doesn't know, it doesn't exist. If I don't find it in God's word, then I don't have anything. Amen. They say, it, 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 there's an African saying that the cow that doesn't have a long tail, it is God that drives his flies. You know how cows use the tail to swat flies of themselves? What about the cows that don't have long tails? These children of Israel were like cows with no long tail. But God said, go, and they are going to walk through a swarm of flies. But God said, go through it. So God must make sure that no, no flies bother them. Amen. So we can see here. So they continued when Moses pled for them, or pleaded for them, they, they received. Look at verse 20. Help me from verse 20, please. Verse 20 of Numbers 14, verse 20. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God. Okay. But Abraham did not waver through unbelief regarding the promises of God. He did not waver. So even in the midst, it facing uh, age and menopause of his wife, Abraham did not waver. Okay, now come with me to Numbers chapter 14, verse 20, and help whoever is there to help me pick it up. Let's finish up so we can round, we can close. All right. Bible says, verse 20, you can pick up from where I'm going to. He said, then the Lord said, I will forgive you as requested. Help me out. And the Lord said, I have yes. pardoned for you. Hmm. Truly as I live. I will forgive you as you have requested. I will pardon you. Can you see? Every time we go to God with a sincere heart, expect to receive in repentance, in repentance, expect to receive forgiveness. That is the character of our father. Amen. Come on, amen. When you say, I'm, I'm not doing this anymore, Lord, and I, I, I admit that I did the wrong, I'm changing my mind. Bible says, God said, I will forgive you as you have requested. Now, look at verse 21. But as I live, and as the Lord's glory fills the entire, none of the men who saw my glory and signs I did in Egypt and in the desert, but tested me these 10 times and haven't listened to my voice, will see the land I promised to give to their ancestors who disrespected me. And he said they won't see. Can you see the disadvantage of disbelieving God? Help me finish verse chapter 14, when you get home, please. Let me respect time. Can you see? When you don't believe, you can't enjoy. Amen? What you cannot see first in your mind's eye, you can never get it. You can never get there. Hallelujah. You got to believe first. You, gotta be you see, some of us, that is why the people say that we are not smart. Maybe, I don't know. Some people think that we are not smart because I listen to God's word and I'm repeating it, Lord, I have your wisdom. I am wise. I am, but I just made an error. The fact is that I made, I did, a, I took a dumb, a dumb step. I did something that wasn't right, but I come back to God and I say, Lord, I, I repent and I ask for your forgiveness. And you know what, Lord, I thank you because Christ is the wisdom of God and the power of God and Christ is in me. So I have wisdom. I make right decisions. You just made an error. But I say to God, I made the right decision. After I have repented, now I confess what his word says about me. I speak it. I speak it. I speak it. I speak it. I speak it till it becomes, it gets into my subconscious that I have the wisdom of God in me. Amen. That is what it means to, to study the word of God. 
Bible says that by the stripes of Jesus, we were healed, not going to be healed, not being healed, but we were healed. So many of us are waiting to see the place, the pain disappear or the injury disappear before we know that we are healed. That is not the way of God. The way of God says, when you ask, believe that you have received it and you shall have it. When God says to you, I'm taking you there, start to dress up for the place, start to dress up for the place. Hallelujah. I, I, let me round up with this testimony. Many years ago, I was still back in Africa. And I remember vividly, God said, pack up, go back, go to United States, and you are going to be working there. It took me 10 years because I was really enjoying what I was doing in Africa. It took me 10 years to get ready. But when finally I say, yes, Lord, reluctantly, I started to dress up. I remember sit, living in a place where I wasn't interested in any other thing. I wake up in the morning, I would study and study and study. I wake up and cook and eat and go back to study. I studied. Someone brought me drinking water, better drinking water from that is better than the one I was getting where I live. And the person said to me, why are you always indoor like a hermit? You don't go out, you don't socialize. What, what are you doing with books and books and notepads and notepads? And I say to the person, I said, I'm preparing because God said to me, I'll be going from one country to another teaching leaders about him. The, this person, a good friend of mine, laughed out so loud that I almost felt stupid. Almost, I didn't feel stupid. I almost felt stupid. All of a sudden I said, oh, no, I don't think she understand what I said. I repeated it and then she started laughing more. So I just concluded that we are different levels. I kept on studying. I wasn't interested in knowing the community. No, that wasn't, that was the time to dress up. That was the time to stuff my spirit up with the word. And I kept doing it. I kept doing it. Several years later on, I went back to the same, to, to the same country and F Fred and I, my, my elder Fred here was with me that day. He showed up at, the, at this particular home of the, of the person who, laughed at, who was laughing at me. He's a Christian, you know, very good Christian and a good friend of mine today because she cooks good. So I like to visit the house. So when I went over there and I say, hey, we are here. Uh, we came over here. So, you know, my favorite sauce, make my favorite sauce. We're coming for dinner. And then she said to me, after we had dinner, I said, pastor, I want you to forgive me. Many years ago, I remembered laughing at you when you locked yourself in your room and you were studying and preparing for what you are doing today. She said to me, I will never forget it. He said, I will never doubt you anymore. Anything you said, God told you to do, I will never doubt you anymore. What am I saying that to say? I'm saying that to say, instead of worrying about, I don't have this, I don't have that, I can't do this, I can't do that, start dressing yourself, start preparing. God said, you're gonna run a business, start studying how to operate, run a business. God says, if you have a desire for anything, start preparing for it. There may be challenges, there may be hindrances, there may be things on your mind, telling you maybe because of this you can't, because of that you can't, don't dwell on those things. Dwell on the fact that God can bring your dreams to pass. You are a winner. You are a success. See yourself as such. May the Lord bless you. Amen. Come on, may the Lord bless you in the name of Jesus. If Abraham had seen himself as somebody who couldn't have children, there would be no nation of Israel today. Or maybe even if there, there is, if Abraham's name wouldn't have been associated with it. Finally, I want to say, God is not going to give you something that you alone can do. He will give you something bigger than what you can do so that you can invite him to be your partner. But when you partner with God, you are already a winner before you started. Change your mental picture of you. Change the mental picture of your family. Change the mental picture of your future. See yourself the way God sees you. You are healed. You are blessed. You can. And yes, he's, he's saying to you, yes, you can. May the Lord bless us in Jesus' name. Shall we pray? 
Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. I just got, I just preached myself happy now. I just got myself excited. God's word is true. I have seen it happen in my life. It has come to pass in my life and God has not changed. Amen. And it's, it's, it's your turn to experience it now. Amen. It's your turn to experience it. It's your turn to experience it. Can you ask God to help you remove the images, the mental pictures you have of you? Ask God to help you remove them. Your background doesn't matter. The children of Israel had no background. They were slaves. They had no good background. They were slaves. Your, your status doesn't matter. The children of Israel had no nice status. Their status was the status of a slave. Status of slaves. Joseph was a slave. Daniel was a slave. Esther was a slave. No reputation, no rank, no qualification, no nothing. They had no one, no one with them. But they trusted the Lord and God used them to bring revolutions to develop worlds. It is your turn and my turn today. What you have in your hand may be ordinary. It is not about what you have in your hand. It is about who is holding your hand. If you allow God to hold your hand, the rod that you have in your hand will become a rod that works signs and wonders. It is not the amount that you have that matters. If you go by God's word, the woman with the little bottle of oil in her house dug herself out of debt with half a bottle of olive oil. You may have more than a bottle of olive oil. It is not about the amount. It is about your faith in the ability of God. I want you to know that the problems that we have, we have in our families are not here to stay. I want you to know that the future of your children is good because God is their father. I want you to know that God is interested in raising you up from the dust to sit you up in a place of honor. But you have first to believe and yield to him totally. Not looking at what you are seeing, not focusing on what the facts are, but focusing on what his word says. If he says, I'm giving it to you, then you better sit down and accept it. Get ready for it. Get ready for it. Get ready for it. Could you please, please allow God to change the relationships you have. Commit your relationships to God. And say, Lord, if this is not the right fit for me, give me your own choice. Put the right person in my life. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Hallelujah. We praise you. Father, we choose to change the image we have of ourselves. We choose your image of us. You said we can, we believe we can. You said we have it, I believe I do have it. You said I am healed, for you took my infirmities, I have no single doubt. I believe I have a clean bill of health. You said it is well with me, you said I'm blessed. Even if I'm going through a turmoil right now, I know I am blessed. He said, you have encompassed the righteous with favor as with the shield. I know that I am favored both by God and man. Thank you, Father. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Father, I want to also thank you for those who are rededicating their lives to you today. I want to thank you for those who got saved today. I want to thank you for those that are being healed today. I want to thank you for 
those that are being changed and transformed in various ways today. May your name be glorified in the name of Jesus. Amen. Come on, amen. Before you, before you remove the recording, let me just share something briefly. A few years ago, I was very ill, really, really ill. And I was banging my head left and right looking for answers. I wanted to hear from God. And God wasn't talking to me. Because God does not speak when we are anxious. He says in the, in the place of quietness and peace. All right? That's where God's voice is. Finally, when he wanted to help me, he spoke to me, made a statement. He said, stop thinking those thoughts. Stop thinking those thoughts. With all the things I went through for several months, going from one specialist to another, the only thing that he, could, that he could, was talking about was my thoughts. That was what I, I felt. Lord, I expected you to touch me. Let me feel that electric, electricity of the Holy Spirit flowing through me, clearing the mess up. And you are just telling me to change my thoughts? Thank God he didn't change his mind because he didn't even respond to my question in my heart. When I started working on my thought life and replacing my thought life with what he said about me, Within a month, I ran two kilometers because I was running at the time. And I was very pleased with myself. Then I ran four. Then I ran five. For those of you who are very good at it, you might think, is that anything to rejoice about? After several months, you've not been able to do it. You think it's serious. For the Bible says, God says, as a man thinks in his heart, so he is. I want to encourage you to please change the way you think about yourself. You fail, God is aware. You may be physically weak, he is aware. But focus on what he said. He said, I am your strength. Focus on that. Amen. Amen. Focus on the fact that he says, you can. Tell yourself, I can. Focus on the fact that he said, you will. And start getting ready for it. The change is coming. Love you all.